Hello. Um, first of all, thanks very much to the Sharps for having me here. You've done a great job. And um, yeah, my name is Alex. I'm a freelance web developer person from Berlin. And uh, yeah, brief disclaimer before I start. Um, I w I've never used one of these. Wait, uh, cool, works. Um, I work on Hoodie. So Hoodie kind of does this whole no backend thing I'm going to be talking about. So it's close to my heart, but it's not going to be very technical. And it's not going to be Hoodie promotion. Not entirely, at least. So if you want Hoodie promotion, come and find me afterwards or come and find Jan, who's moved here. This guy. Follow the beard. OK. Um, anyway, I want to start with, with an anecdote, really. So I used to do ActionScript free development. And a couple of years ago, I noticed that that ship was not only sinking, but also on fire. So I <laughs> abandoned it. And I thought JavaScript looks nice. And it's kind of the same language. So I thought I'd build something with it just to get the hang of it and to not you know, throw myself at clients completely unprepared. And at that time, I had this train of thought. So Tumblr is full of amazing music. Tumblr is terrible for actually listening to music. Maybe I can change that. So I thought I'd build an app in JavaScript to make listening to music on Tumblr cool. And this is what I built. It's called Whiskey, and it does that, basically. You authenticate against the Tumblr OAuth, and you get all the music from your dashboard, basically. And you can listen to just the music in a continuous playlist. That was pretty cool. But since Tumblr is this uh, incessant torrent of stuff that never stops, I wanted people to be able to favorite things so they didn't lose them. So I built a favorites list. And uh, that was cool. Now you could save stuff, and it would never go away. But that posed a problem for me, because it meant data storage. And I was clueless about this. I'd never done this before. I had never written a SQL query. It was always somebody else who did that for me. Um, so naturally, I wanted to do this in, in the easiest possible way. And the thought I had at the time, when a user OAuths against Tumblr, I have read access to everything they do. I also have write access. I had a cunning plan. <laughs> I was going to use Tumblr as a backend. And uh, so I ended up using one Tumblr post draft as a JSON store, basically. And that worked fantastically. That did everything I wanted. I could have favorites. I was up and running in minutes, basically. It was really easy to do. I didn't have to do anything with PHP or MySQL, and it just worked. It was great. I loved it. Except I couldn't make that data public, which I wanted to do later on. So. Then I had to use PHP and MySQL, and uh, everything went down the drain. And I haven't looked at it in years. Um, but I got a taste of what I wanted. I just couldn't formulate what I wanted back then. It was right in front of me and staring at me, but I couldn't put it into words. And what I wanted was to not have a backend. I wanted that backend to be a service or an API. And now, years later, these things exist. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So being able to build full-featured web applications on the browser side and not worrying what goes on on the server. And I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds very desirable. Um, I'm primarily a front-end developer, as you've heard. But in practice, of course, I'm not. I'm a both-end developer, as many of you probably are. Not by choice, because what else are you going to do? You're going to have to store data at some point. You're going to have to authenticate users at some point, especially if this is not a big client project where somebody else is doing all the back-end work, but it's a prototype, or it's an experiment, or it's a personal thing. You're going to have to do it yourself. And that leads us to these old friends. And I know I could sit down and work with these, and I have in the past, and I can make it work. But those are full-time jobs, and people make their living off these things. And I could do this. I could hack something together that would work. But it wouldn't be very good. It would take me ages. And most importantly, I just don't want to. I mean, we just had it in the previous talk. There's too much to keep in your head at any one time. You can't be good at everything. So it, that's not my job. It's not my expertise. I don't enjoy it. I would probably find really entertaining ways to make terrible security mistakes. And I'm probably not the person who should be building my own backend, period. So really, what do I need? So what do most web apps need at the very basic level? You want to sign up users and be able to have them sign in, sign out, resend their passwords when they're forgetful. You want to administer them, see how many you have, send them an email, or delete them if they're naughty. You want to let them save and load data, because otherwise, what, what's the point? Um, you want to let them share it or make it public, maybe send an email or two, and ideally, let them pay you for it. That's not very interesting. 
people have been doing all of that stuff for years, and yet we are rebuilding it all the time, or we're using frameworks to do it, or we're using, you know, it, it's always still work. All of this is still work, and it's so boring, really. It's not interesting. It shouldn't be do, done again and again and again. It's just pointless waste of time. So, thing is, building the web isn't exactly rocket science. And that's not just a saying like that, because rocket science is dictated by the laws of the natural world, you know, gravity and stuff. But the web isn't, it's arbitrary, it's just agreements. The rules aren't God-given or immutable. If we want to change the web, we just can. We don't even have to ask for permission. So again, why is this so hard? It shouldn't be difficult, and it should only take minutes. So, if we can do this with JavaScript, uh, with uh, jQuery, sorry, and change something in the DOM, we all do this you know, on a daily basis, and that's cool. It's nice to work that way. So why can't we sign up a user like this? Why does that seem so outlandish? And that's where the idea of no backend comes in. It makes this possible. So no backend is essentially about delegating things. It turns something that is difficult and full of pitfalls into a commodity, where the tricky and or dull bits are handled by other people who are better at it than you are which is sensible, you do this in all aspects of life, so I doubt any one of you does their own distributed version control, or their plumbing, or their lawyering, or their servering as well, so. <laughs> um, so, but why not backends? Backends are hard. They're made up of a lot of different moving, moving parts, and they all interact with each other, and there's different languages and syntax, and even in the simplest setup, you have various conventions, and everything's 30 years old and stacked on top of each other, and ugh. And that's before you even get a user and start scaling, just setting it up is a problem. And that sounds like the first thing I want to get rid of. And so you can by now. So there's architectures and services that let you more or less forget about the back end. It becomes an API. Uh, you can just build complete data-driven web apps, all in the client side, all in JS, and some of them even throw in cool things like real-time data binding, offline capabilities. And so, no backend is really a misnomer. Of course, there's a backend. You have to put your stuff somewhere. But uh, it's not something you don't have to worry about if you don't want to. And now I'm going to take a drink, sorry. Right, so let's look at some examples. I showed you this a minute ago. So, that's no backend code. It runs in the browser, and it looks, it does exactly what it looks like it does. It signs up a new user. And you can do that a few seconds after you've scaffolded out the app and run it, run it for the first time, you can just go and do that as the first thing you do in the console, and it'll work. And it'll make a proper user, and you can save data for the user, all that <coughs> stuff. And that's real code, that's from Hoodie. Want to store some data? Go ahead, use the store, add an object, and give it some JSON. Just throw some data at it. If it's valid JSON, you'll be fine. And you'll see, I didn't go anywhere and set up a schema or a database or anything. It just takes your data. We trust you to know what your data looks like, so just go ahead. Want to send a multi-part email from the browser? Go ahead, it's 2013. Why should you not be able to do this from the console in the browser, from JavaScript in the browser? And that's a nice example of a no backend philosophy, really. It's all about the API. It's front-end centric, it's user centric. The actual implementation might or might not be complex, but why should we care? It's not an interesting problem. So, in short, that's what no backend is. It's a design paradigm for architectures and frameworks that it abstracts all the complex backend stuff into a simple to use REST API. And so there is a backend, but getting into it is completely optional. And of course, all of these things are usually extensible in some form or another. So if you have more requirements, you can add functionality with plugins or packages. And that's a pretty good setup, in my opinion. So I think you get the general idea, and that's all the code you're gonna see from me today. So first I'm gonna tell you why this is cool, and then I'm gonna tell you why it's important. So what's cool? It's really a new level of simplicity and accessibility for people who want to start coding. So all of these things are either services or installable packages, and they include the entire infrastructure, more or less. So you run it, and it, you have everything at once. No config, no setting things up, no different things that have to be plumbing, plumbed together and wired up. It's quick setup, very low barrier to entry. Well, you used to have a tech stack with various languages and formats and databases and query languages and server config. You potentially now have one language. You have JavaScript in the front end, in the back end, and you have JSON all the way in between. That's really convenient. 
And um, often you have really simple built-in deployment mechanisms that boil down to a single button that says deploy. And it doesn't get more convenient than that. So it's fast. So fast that I have more things to say about speed. So very little config, very little boilerplate code to write. You can start doing substantial things almost immediately. There's nothing standing in the way of the interesting problem you're trying to solve and you solving it. So in addition, different solutions have additional perks, like what I said before, offline modes, life syncing, uh, reactive views, and you just get those for free. They're just in there. It's all the nice new advancements of uh, front-end web tech, and you don't have to do anything. They're just there for you. And it's amazing for extremely rapid prototyping. In the time it takes you to build a wireframe, you can build a functioning app that uses real data, and you can give your test users a real device that behaves like the real thing and see what they do with it. And if it's rubbish, you can iterate really quickly, but you didn't spend much time on the infrastructure. So it gives you focus. You can start the development in the browser where the unique aspects of your app are, where your, user, where your users are, and you can build the user-facing features quickly, validate or dismiss them, experiment, pivot, all you like, without worrying about the infrastructure or schemas or anything. Find out whether the idea is actually worth spending time on. It makes you flexible. So many solutions let you host this wherever you like, as they should, kind of makes sense. So that can be a box in the corner of your office. And suddenly you, you get the advantages of uh, no, sorry, suddenly you get something potentially like an auto-updating, self-hosted and secure device-independent enterprise software thing running in the corner of your office. Because installing that server is just as simple as running it on your own device. It's one line in the terminal, and the whole package comes in. That's it. And that's a pretty good idea. There's a lot of people coming up with this right now. So there's this guy, Bastian, another guy who says, we spend so much time on the internet that we should all have our own digital home. So far, we're only guests. That's a good point. And, and there's a couple of developments in this direction. Of course, for years, you've been able to just cobble together a bunch of open source projects on a Mac Mini and put it under your desk or something. But more user-friendly things are happening. So this, for example, is a, a small German company called Protonet. And it builds servers for businesses. And that's a server. It has one button. When you press that button, you get a self-hosted environment for chat file sharing and groupware. And why should that be any more difficult? Same idea as before. It's 2013. Why can't you just go and buy a box that does this for you? But we were talking about flexibility. So that takes other form forms as well. You could potentially now have a backend as a swappable commodity. If the only way you talk through it is through an API, all you care about is the API. If the stuff behind it changes, that's of no interest to you. If it continues working the same way. So that's nice because you can just switch and migrate somewhere else on the fly. And uh, there's some really completely new approaches to old problems as well, like the idea of having one backend per user. Now, this is really cool. You build a static HTML page, which you host on GitHub Pages, for example, and the users host their data themselves in their Dropbox, their Google Drive, their remote storage. And this is cool because it scales really easily because you don't have the data. Um, data privacy is easier to guarantee because, again, you don't have the data. And you can do cool things like having multiple apps access the same user data, multiple act, apps as accessing one definitive address book, one definitive to-do list that all apps can access and work with. I like that. <laughs> so you no know, backend brings potentially a large increase in simplicity and comfort for people like us. But I think it can do a lot more. And this is actually the main point of my talk. I think we can all agree that at the moment the internet isn't doing so well. So we have huge centralized services, we have ads everywhere, we have bullshit startups, we have ubiquitous surveillance, all of these wonderful things, and it's not good. It's not what it was supposed to be. And I think one of the great chances of this whole no backend approach is being able to turn it around a bit and work against this unpleasant trend that we have. So let's go back in time for a second. You all know this picture, I hope. Uh, that's the ARPANET from 1977. And that was, you know, the precursor to the internet, military network to make <coughs> distributed computing resources more readily available. Because computing time was expensive, and if the computer at your university was in use, there was nothing you could do because the next one was far away. 
And so they decided to make it distributed, and they also decided to make it failure, uh, make it redundant, that the connections were redundant so you didn't have a single point of failure. And that wasn't because of Soviet nukes, that was simply because the technology and the phone lines were so terrible that everything kept breaking anyway. So what we got from that is TCP IP, package switching, and this mental image of the internet. Just nodes connected, and you just send your packages around, and it just works. And that's still somewhat accurate, but in practice, of course, the individual, the individual nodes aren't the same size. It looks more like this. So the big ones are what you expect. So the, the biggest one is Google. Actually, most of, them, most of the big ones are Google. <laughs> uh, one of them is Facebook, and Yahoo, and Apple. And so these are pretty significant points of failure now. Lots and lots of traffic goes through single nodes, and not in the technical sense that we had before, that they route the traffic and then everything breaks if they break. That's not the, that's not the case. But in a more general security sense, because if, if an antagonistic third party can access all the data that flows through there, these nodes must be considered broken, and as we know, that's the case. So ideally, the, the web, even the social web, should be, as it was originally, more distributed and more equally distributed to avoid these kinds of things in the future. And so Tim Berners-Lee says, we must make what he calls social machines for whatever reason, in uh, which people can collaborate together but do it in a way that's decentralized, so it's not based on one central hub. And that's so obvious, I almost feel bad for putting it up there, because I think everyone can agree that that's a good idea. But how would it work? So here's a popular notion. I dream of a future where everyone has their own server, just not like the one you'd think of. It could be your computer at home, it could be a little box next to your TV, maybe a gaming console or a small server somewhere in a data center. It's not important. It would be like having a mobile phone. It might even be your mobile phone. Your own server would be so easy to use and easily integrated with your existing devices that even your granny would have one. Now that's a dream, but it's a good one. That orange protonet box I just showed you, that's a good step in the right direction, but it's a small step. So let's see what this whole no backend paradigm can help. Uh, can do to help get, a, get everything back in that direction. So it can redistribute data and services away from single nodes and single points of failure, either by doing this one back per user thing or by enabling more people to write their own code. Uh, it can decrease the, uh, the number of enormous data silos that can't talk to each other. Uh, through this, enhanced data security and sovereignty and it can provide infrastructural independence from these huge single point of failure providers by turning them into swappable commodities where you can just leave if you don't like them anymore. But most importantly of all, it can empower people to build and or run their own localized tools and solve their own problems. Plus it gives you the best of both worlds. You have the best bits of browser-based applications. They're browser-based. They run anywhere you have a browser. And locally installed software, it's your data and you can potentially just disconnect it from the internet, if you like, and have security as well. So uh, this Baspian guy I quoted, he does something very interesting now. That. So he's forging ahead with this, publicly, publicly working on a concept for a platform that could do these things for us. And he calls it decentralized, it Grand Decentral Station is his name for it. I'm a big fan of this idea because it's keenly aware of the problems, and one of them being security and decentralization aren't actually selling points for non-nerds and for people who aren't in the industry. So we have to make platforms like that so compelling on other fronts, because what's important to us about it, privacy and security, isn't the selling point. And that's the crucial point. The self-hosting, the app developing, the one back and per user, it's all great ideas, but it all has to compete with the incredibly polished company, uh, products of enormous companies. So it has to compete on the levels of functionality, user experience, design, critical user mass, convenience, all of which are perceived as more important than security and privacy. And it's a hard sell. And we're not going to get there by continuing to build stuff basically from nerds for nerds, excuse me using the word. So I don't know how many UX people Facebook has, but Facebook has UX people. Most open source projects don't even have a designer. And if they do, it's usually as an afterthought. So hey, hey, you, make this look nice. But that's nowhere near enough because, you know, design isn't just what it looks and feels like. Design is how it works. So design has to be a part of the entire process of building an open source product or project. 
And what this means, to put it bluntly, is that open source generally isn't for normal people. Open source is for people who think that this represents an exciting opportunity. That's not a majority opinion. The majority wants an iPhone. And that doesn't make the majority stupid or wrong. They just want a good experience. They want to be empowered. They don't want to be encumbered. That's the point. So we need to make it easy, convincing, and enjoyable to move our personal data away from big players. We need great self-hosted applications which we can use to manage all of our stuff. And that means we've got to build better tools. And not only better tools to use the web, but also better tools to make the web. Simpler tools that make general purpose computing more accessible. And that is our job as front end people because the browser isn't just a document viewer, it is de facto the computing runtime. If you teach anyone to program today, you should do it in a browser, in my opinion. So we need to empower people to code and produce things they can actually use in the modern world, in their world, on any device with a browser, just like they do today. So back to making the web. Um, no backend removes a very high barrier to entry to producing what I personally consider that to be that most relevant and useful realm of programming, web applications. And the barrier to entry is a lot higher than we might realize. So we're the white dog and everyone else is the brown dog, and we've got all the tools and the experience and uh, years of dealing with <laughs> awkward documentations and weird APIs and Everyone else just doesn't. I'll just leave that up there for a bit. <laughs> so the simplest form of a traditional web application a beginner might be able to deploy requires you to write HTML, CSS, maybe JavaScript, probably PHP in MySQL, and people work highly paid jobs just doing the first two. And that might not seem bad to us, but to most people that might as well be actual rocket science. Just getting set up locally and remotely and having the things talk to each other that's a task that's going to deter, if not defeat, most people who just want to do this for interest. So what happens is, of course, like water and electricity, people take the task of least resistance. And if that leads them to Google and not to MAMP, which is ostensibly easy, it might as well not be there. And that's the problem. Making the web is still too hard. Using the web used to be hard, too. But it's been made a lot more convenient and simple, but by the wrong people, regrettably. <laughs> um, but by and large, the web today is made by professionals. That's not the point. Never was the point of the web. It's not TV. It's not there to be consumed passively. And just because people upload immense amounts of data to it, photos, video, and audio, that's not making the web. You're just filling it with stuff. We're the ones making the web. But the web isn't just for web developers. The web is an amazing system that can do so much for so many, and yet to most people right now, it's just a photo scrapbook where they tell the government where they are and who they're with. And we're letting one of the greatest feats of human ingenuity degenerate into an interactive lifestyle magazine that spies on you, basically. And one way to remedy this is to put the creative power of making the web back into the hands of individuals, because that was the point all along. And he's not talking about the Olympics. He's talking about the Olympics as well, but he's talking about the internet, really. When he says everyone, he means everyone. Not just web developers, not just corporations, not just ad agencies, everyone. And there are notable precedents for efforts to put computing power back into the hands of amateurs. So back in the 80s, Apple gave us HyperCard. And the creators of HyperCard said they got programming questions from all sorts of people, from all walks of life. And um, it let non-programmers build simple apps and so lots of apps were created that would never have been created if application was left in the hands of professional programmers. And many of those little apps were tailored to what the creator needed at that moment in a way that would never happen if a professional programmer drew up a spec or a marketing researcher had done marketing research. And apparently HyperTalk was what inspired Brendan Eich to make JavaScript in the first place. And there were even hardware add-ons for HyperCard that could exchange signals with external devices like the Arduino or the Tesla that just came out or at least got funded. And in the 70s, even before that, there was small talk, similarly appealing to all sorts of people. Um, the cool thing about this was you had an integrated editor, debugger, execution view in one thing. It was really easy to get going. You started it, and you had everything you needed. 
Uh, small talk and hypercard were interesting because they made programming accessible to people, again, from all walks of life. So they could write useful little things and actually take advantage of these new powers that technology was giving them. Problem was, back then, nobody had the hardware. Today, everyone has the hardware. So what's the equivalent of that today? I'd say the closest thing is JavaScript and front-end web technologies. You can write, run, debug, and use your code in one place. You can modify it while it's running. It's platform independent. It's networked. And if somebody can find your code, they can probably run it as well. It's really powerful. So what we should do is make these powerful tools more accessible, easier to set up, quicker to get started, and deliver it with encouragement instead of looking down on people who know less than us. Learning to program should be about play. It should be about getting things up and running in an afternoon and seeing what happens. It should be about poking things. And I think this whole no back and paradigm can be really helpful. Uh, so helpful, in fact, that it's one of Hoodie's design goals to make its use attractive and intuitive to beginners and non-professionals. And we came up with a process to help us achieve this. And that doesn't do it justice, so there's another slide. <laughs> <coughs> So we called the process dream code because when we designed the initial API, we sat down and we each wrote hypothetical apps that would use a fictional API that didn't exist yet, but which reflected what we thought were the most intuitive, simple, and sensible ways of working from the front end. And we compared them and kind of unified them and made them better and everything. But we didn't start with the system's capabilities and just expose them to the front end. We started with the user's requirements and implement it from there. We wanted people to have a good experience with it. And that's really paid off for us. So what DreamCode essentially is, is user-centered design for APIs. Because our target isn't developers. Our target is people who can scrape by by copy and pasting some jQuery code. That's, we want to let those people build fully-fledged data-driven apps. So we've made that all so much simpler and more convenient, it would be a great waste not to expose it to a greater audience. So we want the power, simplicity, and accessibility of Smalltalk and Hypercard, and even Excel. Think of how much power Excel puts into your hands. We want, to, we want to do that for the web. What that means is, in the end, is that we are designers. We, as developers, are designers. We need to know the fundamentals of design processes and design thinking, not because we need a sweet website for a project or a nicely typeset documentation page, but because using what we build from finding it, to learning about it, to getting it running, working with it, failing with it, asking for help with it, to succeeding with it in the end, all of that is user experience, and we can shape what that experience is. So we are experienced designers. And it pays off to design towards experience, because that's what Google does, what Apple does, and what Facebook does, and what we left to our own devices and just targeting each other, or even only ourselves, often tend to forget. So how many brilliant projects are there on the web that go underused and ignored because the person who made it thought, I didn't have a three-point getting started guide. Why should everyone else? I suffered for this knowledge, and so should you. <laughs> so we're experienced designers, whether we like it or not. What we produce has to be designed to the user's needs, even if it's only you know, a snippet of code in a gist. That's going to get used. People are going to have experiences using it. And it's just a matter of economy, too. If, you, if uh, you do something sloppy in there and you leave something obtuse and complicated and undocumented in there, that time gets wasted every single time someone uses it and tries to figure it out. So in short, just being open isn't enough. Don't believe in this mantra, this open source mantra of trickle-down technology, basically, is what Aral Balkan said. Some of us share a similar philosophy to trickle-down economics, in which we believe that when a te technically savvy elite of enthusiasts build tools and technologies for themselves, that technology will eventually trickle down and help less technical savvy members of society. And just like trickle-down economics, it doesn't work. So calling it the open web and having open standards and open source, all well and good. But at the moment, all this openness, it's more like an open window in the second story, and you have to bring your own ladder. It's not a welcoming open door, basically. And I think. No backend is a great opportunity to help more people shape the web. So in the end, what is it really? It's tech that brings speed, simplicity, and flexibility to web app development for us and for everyone else. It's 
protect, that liberates and empowers by simplifying and lowering barriers of entry. It's tech that distributes applications and kills data silos, if you late that it, really. <laughs> tech that can make the web the platform for entry-level general purpose computing and learning about code. And tech that requires us to think more like product managers and designers so we can build good experiences for other humans. And all of these things are good things. It's, it is our job to make the web more accessible to more people. It's our power. And no one else is going to do this. If we can help people understand it, they can make the web. And if they can make the web, they'll care about the web. And the more people care about, understand, and make the web, the better off we'll all be. Because, as Jeremy Keefe said yesterday, the web is good for our species. And I think we have to take care of it. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.